Welcome to Tales from SYL Ranch, the BitChute channel where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. Well, I've got your attention. I'd like to ask that if you like what I'm doing, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, share me on social media, and tell all of your friends, family, neighbors, pets, and livestock to do the same. I would appreciate your support via my PayPal tip jar, my subscribe star, my merch stores on Teespring, or a place on my website where you can support me further. And there are links to all of these in my description box. In a number of my videos, I have warned that there are some near-term problems that need to be overcome. Some of these problems are potentially catastrophic. However, if you overcome these problems, it won't be easy. To, to overcome them and requires some immediate and concentrated effort, but they can be overcome. Now, as I've discussed in my video, Hollywood has created a nihilistic society. There's a link to that below. Please go watch. Hollywood has created a nihilistic society. Virtually all of our entertainment comes from Hollywood, be it film, TV, streaming, video, music, and even fashions. It all comes from Hollywood. Unfortunately, in Hollywood, California, you will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. It is a place where a handshake means nothing, where backstabbing is commonplace, where everyone curries favor from someone else, and rape and child molestation rule the day. The problem is that since creators live in this wretched hive of scum and villainy, they believe that the entire world is like this. If all you know is horror, then the only art you can create is going to be horrible. You cannot imagine anything else because you've never seen anything else. Unfortunately, Hollywood's descent into outright horror has had an effect on modern society. Since all of the popular art that we consume, video, music, fashion, etc., are all nihilistic, this has led to our culture becoming nihilistic as well. We've all started to believe that the world around us is as bad or worse than the horror Hollywood portrays. Now, as an example, I'm going to use my favorite franchise, Star Trek. I'm just barely old enough to have watched the original series in its original run on NBC starting in season two in 1967. And I've been a Trekkie ever since. Now, as most of the artwork that came out of Hollywood during that period through basically the early 2000s, the overwhelming majority was relatively optimistic. Those that weren't optimistic were standouts. They were unusual, something that you watched or went to in a theater because they had a specific and, and unusual emotional effect. The, the reason that our entertainment was largely optimistic was interesting. Inasmuch as the creators of that era all lived under the threat of death by nuclear war, whereas modern creators live under no real threat whatsoever. In fact, they've had to make up a few to believe in, such as the global warming doomsday scenario. Neither this nor any other science fictional doomsday scenario that they believe in will ever come to pass. It probably has to do with the fact that the greatest generation was largely in charge of entertainment until the 1980s and even into the 1990s to some extent. And the baby boomers, they were in charge until the 2000s. It was only with my generation that things started to go really south. The greatest generation had lived through the worst war in American history. And none of them had come out of it unscathed. There were fantastic losses on all sides. The U.S. had 407,300 military deaths and another 12,100 civilian deaths. And there were 670,846 wounded, which gives us a grand total of 1,090,246 out of a total population at that time of about 133,000 million, rather, 402,000. The U.S. actually got off easy. The USSR lost 26.6 million, roughly 25 times that of the United States. Nevertheless, there was no one at home or abroad who was untouched by World War II. It was a bloody war, the bloodiest in human history, and not just in terms of casualties, but in the way that the war was waged with modern mechanization and air power. The people touched by that war were very actively wanting to build a better world for their children, and that included the creators of their popular entertainment. Gene Roddenberry, 
was the creator of Star Trek, and he was one such individual. Roddenberry flew 89 combat missions in World War II as a pilot in the Army uh, Air Forces, which was the predecessor to the modern U.S. Air Force. Later, as a civilian pilot for Pan American, Roddenberry was involved in a crash that put he and his passengers down in the Syrian desert. He suffered two broken ribs and dragged injured passengers from the aircraft. There were 14 deaths, 11 passengers who were hospitalized, and eight who were unharmed. And then Roddenberry led the passengers to help from the middle of the Syrian desert. Roddenberry's experiences as a pilot were far from unique for those of his generation, nor were his wartime experiences unique. James Doohan, the actor who played Scotty, was shot twice during the D-Day invasion of Germany, and one of those shots resulted in the amputation of his right middle finger. In short, the generation that created film, TV, and music from the 1950s all the way through the 1970s and 1980s and sometimes later had already seen their fair of shit and then some. They didn't want to make nihilistic entertainment. They wanted what they made to have a good impact on the world. Because of Roddenberry's goal for Star Trek, it was simple. The backstory for his show was this, that despite all the problems man of the 1960s faced had all been peacefully resolved. Whatever plot problems came up in Star Trek, none of man's foibles were among them. If modern problems ever came up, it was the told explicitly to the audience that they had been managed to be solved peacefully. Roddenberry broke new ground with Star Trek in many ways. He made a show with a black female officer, something totally unheard of at the time. And by the way, this also led to the first interracial kiss on American TV. He had a Japanese officer at a time when most of America still called the Japanese Japs and looked down on them at best. And the Japanese officer, of course, was played by a homosexual. Now, the character was straight, but George Takei has become something of a gay rights activist in modern times. Roddenberry had a Russian officer at a time when tensions between the U.S. and the USSR were at their highest, and there was on a couple of occasions we damn near went to nuclear war. And then there was Spock, a character that Roddenberry had to fight for. NBC was just certain that Spock's pointed ears and rather satanic look would alienate viewers of the American Bible Belt and Southern states. And they couldn't have been more wrong, with Spock being the most popular character on the show in the 1960s. A third of the ship's crew were female at a time when women were expected to be homemakers. The ship, being one-third female, by the way, was a compromise. Roddenberry had wanted it to be one-half, but NBC objected, and he decided that he didn't want to die on that particular hill, considering all the other problems he was having with them. Now, the many dresses that you see in the original series sometimes seem sexist in modern times, but in the context of the 1960s, they weren't. The women's movement was in full swing, and one of the ways that was, this was expressed was by women throwing away their knee-length or lower dresses and skirts for many skirts. It was seen as a form of female emancipation. Now, Nichelle Nichols, who played that black female officer, Uhura, has often been quoted as saying that she intentionally rehemmed her dresses higher than issued to her by her costume department. That's just how big a deal it was. Star Trek was a unique program for its time, and the most important aspect being that Roddenberry wanted to portray a hopeful future where mankind and aliens lived and worked together in peace. Roddenberry shepherded the franchise all the way from its first pilot in 1964 through the second season of Star Trek The Next Generation in 1988. Throughout that entire period, he fought sometimes tooth and nail to maintain his optimistic version of the future. Ultimately, health concerns forced Roddenberry to retire. So from about 1988 to 2005, Rick Berman shepherded the Star Trek franchise. Berman was a baby boomer. Now, while he had never seen the horrors of war himself, his parents had. I'm sure he heard about it. Between this and many of his generation being drafted into Vietnam, the baby boomer generation had no interest in portraying nihilism nor horror in their entertainment. Berman was rather particularly adamant that Roddenberry's optimistic view of the future be maintained. During his stewardship, stewardship of the franchise, that was the one constant of all the series and movies he produced. Star Trek's future was optimistic. 
All of today's problems had been peacefully solved. And by the way, Berman is now a producer on The Orville, and you'll note that that is the only science fiction on TV that actually portrays an optimistic view of the future. From 2005 until 2009, Star Trek lay dormant. But then J.J. Abrams took the helm for three movies. Abrams turned Star Trek into generic action schlock. The series had previously highlighted scientific problems as part of their plots, but these were always couched around stories that had some kind of social relevance to the problems of their time. Roddenberry often said that he could get away with making social commentary because it was some science fiction thing and the network censors didn't care that much. Abrams was smart enough to keep Roddenberry's hopeful vision of a future, but he's really just an action director. And that's what Star Trek became, watered down action schlock with no greater meaning than the movement of the characters from one action set piece to another. The movies have laid dormant since 2016, but in 2017, my generation and the one after took over. These two men are Alex Kurtzman and Brian Fuller, the men responsible for Star Trek Discovery. They are two generations or more removed from anyone who dealt with the real horrors of World War II. They are the generation that grew up knowing nothing other than the wretched hive of scum and villainy that is Hollywood. Unlike their predecessors, they have only known horror and artificial crises in their lives, and they're unable to produce anything other than horror. Small wonder that their version of Star Trek explicitly rejects a hopeful vision of the future, both philosophically and in tone. And for them, the entire notion of optimism is laughable. Their Star Trek, like all entertainment created by their generations, have gone full Al-Qaeda. In one particularly memorable episode, they showed an infant's decapitated head. I am quite sure that Gene Roddenberry is spinning in his grave at Warp 10. He would never in a million years have approved of this sort of outright horror. Next year, Star Trek Discovery will see the show, show jump forward in time by a thousand years. And by then, the United Federation of Planets, Roddenberry's hopeful vision incarnate, will have fallen into a distant, distant memory. And this is, by the way directly stealing from another Roddenberry-inspired series of the early 2000s, Andromeda. Kurtzman and Fuller will have intentionally destroyed everything Roddenberry held dear with Star Trek because they cannot imagine a hopeful future. All of this is symptomatic. Star Trek just makes a really good uh, example, it, but it's systematic of modern Hollywood. It's now run by creators who can no longer imagine anything hopeful. They are, they, they are so mired in the horror of their industry that it has blinded them to anything positive in the world. And worse, it has conditioned my children's generation and later to expect nothing but horror in their lives and in the future. Today, there's very little you can find on TV that doesn't portray horror. Virtually all science fiction and fantasy, with the sole exception of the Orville, portrays nothing but things that would outright disgust later generations, earlier generations. Hollywood has conditioned us to expect only horror and doom in our lives and in our future. Now make no mistake, we have real problems that need to be overcome. Our most immediately pressing problem is what the American left will do when Trump wins in 2020. The entire viable field of Democratic candidates are outright socialists and communists. They cannot possibly compete with Trump, and their political philosophies are abhorrent to the majority of Americans. It's all but certain that Trump will win in 2020, and there's every reason to believe that the left will trigger a civil war because of it. Now, if that happens, I hope that the combatants on the rational side will heed my warnings and tactics outlined in my video, Winning the Second American Revolution in a Week. And there's a link to that in my description box below as well. And, I, and in that video, I outline how such a civil war could be won in only a week and with relatively little bloodshed. But if they don't heed my ideas, then there will be blood in the streets. 
Brother will be pitted against a brother and father against son. And more people will die than in the last civil war. And as an ultimate solution for all this, I also recommend that California be, be broken into two states. The first will be California, and that will include the heavily populated coasts from San Diego all the way up to San Francisco. And then there will be Jefferson, which would include the entire rest of California. And then California should be encouraged to secede voluntarily from the United States to become its own communist nation. Now, the details of this, by the way, I have laid out and kind of ready as an evergreen show. It will be the subject, the specifics of an upcoming video. Once the new nation of California is quarantined from the rest of the United States, Hollywood and the left's destructive and cancerous influence on the rest of the Union can be reduced or even eliminated. Our other looming problem is the United States public debt. It is now somewhere between more money than exists in the United States and more money than exists in the entire world, and nobody knows what the true figure is. No other nation in history, in all of recorded history, has ever indebted itself to this degree. Any of them that have even come fractionally close, I mean tiny fractionally close, that's how far off we are into the twilight zone on this one. Any that have come fractionally close have all experienced a currency collapse followed by a governmental collapse, and I see no reason to believe that the United States would be any different. At some point, it will sink into the world that this debt can never be repaid. It will cause a massive collapse. It will almost certainly collapse food supply chains, leading to death by starvation in America's cities by the tens of millions. Now, there's a solution for this, but it takes concerted effort. Bluntly, the United States federal government must be reduced to its constitutional limits. Our elected officials must be forced, at gunpoint if necessary, to give up the power that they so desperately crave. They must be forced, at gunpoint if necessary, to repeal the millions of laws and regulations that are not within the purview of the federal government under the Constitution. Once this is done, the U.S. economy will become so productive that payments to the public debt may even at least become possible. It may be mathematically impossible to ever pay the debt at this point, but it is if you go back to the Constitutional Republic with a booming economy even better than the one we have now, far far better. We'll at least make some token payments and we won't be continuing to go farther into the red and it may be able to pull the wool over the governments and the world for at least a couple of generations. And perhaps after a century or so of a constitutional republic, at least attempting to repay its debt while the economy becomes something truly astonishing again, as it has been in the past, debt may become payable. But we must still reduce the federal government's power to only that tiny fraction of things that are authorized under the Constitution. To do otherwise means certain doom. The restoration of the Constitutional Republic will automatically end the threat of socialism and communism in the U.S. With the federal government at constitutional levels, it is impossible to institute socialist and communism in the United States. We can have an optimistic future. We can have a world in which our modern ills are completely eradicated. A future of technolo technological marvels and gleaming, shining cities. But to do it, we must avoid the chaos and death of a looming civil war. And we must restore the Constitutional Republic. Only then will the problems of racism, sexism, white nationalism, and homophobia completely disappear. Only then will we see the gleaming, shining, futuristic cities that you see over my shoulder. And only then will we brave space, the final frontier, with the kind of society that Gene Roddenberry portrayed in Star Trek. To do otherwise will lead to the horror that those in Hollywood are currently peddling. And that's all I have to say about that. So, 
Thank you for watching. I'd love to keep the conversation going, so please leave your comments, questions, and nasty remarks, and I'll do my best to respond to you. That's all the time that we have today for this episode of the highly acclaimed, world-renowned Tales from SYL Ranch, the BitChute channel where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.